because I have here like seven or eight exercises, okay, and a couple of challenges. Yeah, okay, so let us go back to the idea of the cavity method that some of you have been asking. And I left an exercise uh, to derive the, uh, from the cavity equations, the cavity equations for the cavity fields. Have you done this? Have uh, you managed to do it? Yeah? Everybody of you. So I, okay, so the idea was the following. So remember that to present the cavity method, we use the Easing Hamiltonian on a graph. So we have uh, the Easing Hamiltonian on a graph. I think I introduced something like this, the double sum for i and j belonging to the graph of j i j sigma i sigma j minus the sum for i from 1 to n h i sigma i, right? And then I motivated uh, the cavity method to say, suppose you want to focus on the magnetization, et cetera, et cetera, remember, right? And at some point, so, so the idea of the, this motivation is to, it was to emphasize that I was obsessed to calculating single site marginals uh, from the Gibbs Boltzmann distribution. And we, what we found out in the derivation is that the uh, probability, this would be sigma, sorry, I'm anticipating another thing, the probability of finding the spin at no time again configuration sigma i can be written as one over a normalization factor of the exponential of beta h i sigma i. Uh, so the product, okay, let me do it. Let me do one more step. The sum over all con possible configurations for the neighborhood of i of the exponential of beta uh, sigma i, the sum for l belonging to the neighborhood of i of j i l sigma l times the joint distribution when i has been removed of the neighborhood of i. Yeah? And then here we said in a graph, if I remove i, this joint distribution becomes the product of distributions. If, and if it's not exact, then it's the, what, the so-called Betty approximation, right? So we say pi neighborhood of i of sigma di, this is equal to this. Uh, and this exact one, g, is a three. If it's, and it's, if the graph is not a tree, then it's an approximation. Right. And from there, we get these cavity equations that say that pi sigma i, well, this is not still the cavity equation, pi sigma i is equal to 1 over set i, exponential of beta h i sigma i, the product for l belonging to the neighborhood of i, of the exponential of beta uh, of the no, sum over sigma L, exponential of beta sigma I, J I L sigma L, the marginal at not L when I has been removed. Yeah. And the way to close these equations, I left this thing as an exercise, maybe I'll solve it, I'll solve it later, because these are not closed equations, because this object here is not the same as this object here. The way to close these equations, you do the same exercise, you remove a node, and you obtain that P without J at not I is equal to one over set I without J for the exponential of beta H I sigma I, the product for L belonging to the neighborhood of I without A, the sum over sigma L beta uh, sigma I J I L sigma L, and this. And these are the ones what, that we call the cavity equations for the cavity marginals, yeah? Now, I said that uh, you can uh, parameterize these cavity marginals using cavity fields. I can write down that now, for instance, that uh, pi without j sigma i can be written as the exponential of beta h i without j sigma i divided by two times a parabolic cosine of beta with tilde h i tilde without j. 
And I said, if uh, proof that if you put this thing into here, you get the cavity equations for the cavity fields. Have you tried to do this? You managed to solve uh, to the derivation. Who tried to manage? Uh, who, who tried to to work it out and didn't manage? Don't be shy. First time I tried, I couldn't manage. I spent days, days doing how the f how on earth they do this derivation. Shall we do it? Yeah. So, how we do it? Well, I mean, the way do, uh, we do it is very simple. Well, the idea is very simple. I have to put this thing into here, yeah? And work out the expression somehow to get the, the cavity equations for the cavity fields. But there are smart ways to do this. So, what is the smart way? Well, smart way. One or simpler way. Well, it's to realize, first of all, that the, from, the following from this definition of this parameterization of the of the of the cavity marginal, I realized that the cavity field H i of when J has been removed tilde is equal to the, the one divided by two beta the sum over sigma i sigma i the logarithm of P i without J sigma i. Right. Yes? Well, why is that? Because if I take this, uh, this definition, yeah, I have the logarithm. The logarithm with the exponential will give me the argument. The argument will be multiplied by sigma i. And then I have sigma i squared. Sigma i takes pl uh, values plus minus 1. I do the sum over sigma i. That will give me a 2. That cancel the 2. The beta over there cancel this beta over here. And then I have the logarithm of the denominator. The denominator is a constant. And I have the trace over sigma i, which is 0, because it takes values plus minus 1. What's up? Here? Did, did this, ah, sorry? Yeah, it's, it's sigma, it's sigma l. Maybe I, I, I remember I'm a, I'm a pure, poor human being, and maybe I do mistakes when I rush. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. More questions? Go ahead. Okay. Let us do it. Yeah. Is that okay? This comes uh, just from this parameterization, right? So this is equal to what? According to so let us say that this is let us check that this is true. Okay, so this is equal to one divided by two beta the sum over sigma i, sigma i the logarithm of this parameterization, which is the exponential of beta h i without j tilde sigma i divided by two times the hyperbolic cosine of beta h i tilde without j. Right. Now, what do I have in the numerator? I have uh, 1 divided by 2 beta, the sum over sigma i, sigma i, and then the log of the exponential will give you the argument. And this would be beta h i without j tilde sigma i. And then I have minus 1 divided by 2 beta, the sum over sigma i, the logarithm of 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of beta h i without j tilde. Good? Now, remember, OK, it works in this case, because in this case, the sigma i's are is in variables, and take, they have values plus minus 1, right? So in this case, you have sigma i squared, which is 1, right? And then you have the sum over sigma i that takes two values. And then you have a, a 2 beta that cancel this 2 beta. So this first term is directly h i tilde without j. Yes? And the second one here, I'm missing, uh, apparently, I'm missing a lot of things today. Here, you have the sum over sigma i, sigma i log of a constant, something that does not depend on sigma i. And the sum over sigma i of sigma i is 0, because it takes values plus minus 1. So this is 0. Better? Good. 
questions? No, so then we use this in the cavity questions for the cavity marginals. Yeah? So what I have, let's try to do it here. So what we have is what I know that the cavity field HI when J has been removed is equal to this object here, one divided by two beta. And now, okay, let me put the whole piece and let, let us do it step by step. The sum over sigma, uh, sigma I, the logarithm of all that, right? One divided by the normalization factor exponential of beta h i sigma i, the product for L belonging to the neighborhood of i without j of the sum over sigma L. And I put here the definition of the cavity marginal in terms of the cavity field. So this would be what? This would be a exponential of blah, 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 beta sigma i that multiplies J I L sigma L plus H L tilde without I divided by two times the hyperbolic cosine of beta H L without I. Help me, uh, have I missed something? I don't think so. Sigma L, factor where? Here? So I have beta sigma I, J I L sigma L, and I put this, this is sigma L. Ah, and I put, ah, yeah, yeah, so, so this is, this is the other way around. Yeah, thank you very much. Like this. Yeah? Excellent. How do you know that the solution of these cavity equations come out as the solution of the cavity equations? This one here? Yeah. Because we did the derivation, I think, during the first lecture, no, during the second day, right? But uh, we did actually the derivation for the one above, right? The, the one I just uh, erased. The one where here I have the joint distribution. Uh, and I left this thing as an exercise that we're going to do today as well. Uh, uh, no, I was saying about the, uh, the solution of that equation. Uh, how does the solution on the right is right? How, how do you know that? How do I know that I can write this thing in this way? Yeah. Ah, well, because, okay, because uh, sigma i takes two values, right? plus one and minus one, okay? So that means since the, this is a, a Boolean variable or a Ising variable, a variable that takes two values, to fully characterize this, this probability, you only need one number, yeah? Because I, have, I only have to characterize the probability, let us put it like this, the probability that at not i without j, sigma i is equal to plus one, yeah, because I know that if I have the other one, since this is normalized, I only need one number, right? So let us call this guy something. Let us call this i, this guy a parameter. A without j, i, right? Then I know that I might need the probability that sigma i takes value minus one. But since this, the, the probability is normalized, this is equal to one minus some parameter a, one minus a without, no? Ai without j, right? So the only thing I'm emphasizing here that I only need a real number to fully characterize this distribution because a distribution where the random variable takes two values. Are you with me? Right? Just one parameter. So this is a, a smart way of, of expressing this parameter. Okay. More questions? This is not an approximation, this is an answer, it's not an answer, it's a way to parameterize the distribution. Uh, following your terminology, why is the ability of A? We can get that it has this one. Sorry? Sorry, um, following the same equation, how we can get that the ability of A has that 
has this form, this one here, well, from the definition, yeah? This is a definition of how I'm going to parameterize the distribution. And the only thing I, I realize is that this cavity field can be extracted from this distribution doing this expectation value. It's, it's just that, because that's a definition, and therefore from the definition, yeah? More questions? Come on, don't be shy. That's it. Can I continue? Yeah. Very good. So now notice the following, right? Here I have the logarithm on th of the product on things in a numerator and things in the denominator, okay? In the denominator, what, what I have, I have constant and I have a constant. When I apply the logarithm, since I have to do the trace over sigma, I, that will give me zero, like before. So I'm not going to worry about anymore about this guy and this guy. Then I have the log of products, okay? That would be the sum of the logs, and here I have the, the sum. All right, so I forget about the denominators. And then what I have here is the following. Uh -huh. That this is equal to, so let me see, uh, equal to 1 divided by 2 beta, the sum over sigma i, sigma i, the logarithm of what? I'm going to do it step by step, of the exponential of beta h i, sigma i, just like before. And now I have the log of the product, and this would be plus the sum over the neighborhood of i without j, of what? Of 1 divided by 2 beta, the sum over sigma i, sigma i, the log of, uh, ba, 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 of this trace here, no? The log of the sum over sigma l of the exponential of beta sigma l j i l sigma i plus the cavity field at tell when i has been removed. Yeah? What's up? Sorry? This is a constant. Because it was, this, this came in the derivation from the, uh, it's a constant in the sense that, okay. Okay, so sometimes when I say it's a constant, it's with respect to certain variables. When I say here it's a constant, it's with respect to these dynamical variables. Of course, this is not a constant because it depends on the temperature yeah, but I'm focusing on the dependence on sigma. Since this is the ratio of two partition functions, right? The partition function of the, of the original system and the partition function where I remove something, et cetera, et cetera, this cannot depend on sigma. So I'm focusing on the dependence on sigma. Yeah? That's why I mentioned that it's a constant. I, I cannot see why this ratio means that it doesn't depend on sigma. Well, okay. sure, because this, sure, because this ratio, remember that, uh, 1 over set i in the relationship between pi sigma i and the cavity marginals, this was in the derivation. This was what? It was set divided by set without i. And what is set? It's the partition function. So set is the sum over all possible configuration of the exponential of minus beta h of sigma. And doing the trace over the all the values of the spins, this cannot depend on the spins. Yeah? So when I, of course it depends on the temperature, it can depend on other control parameters, but when I say it's a constant, I, I'm referring to the spins, the dynamical variables. Better? Good. Excellent. Very good. More questions, guys. Don't be shy. Guys, don't be shy. No? That's it? Very good, so this is trivial now, right? Because I have the same, this, this expression is the same as before, the same trick. So therefore this is equal to hi. And what is this? Well, this is a bit of a nightmare, but you do it and uh, cross the fingers that at the end of the day everything is right. So this will be equal to what? The sum for all, over all the neighborhood of i without j of one divided over two beta of what? Okay, I have the sum over sigma i sigma i, the logarithm, and this trace is trivial, no? This trace is the two times the hyperbolic cosines of the argument in the exponential, right? 
So this is 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of j i l sigma i plus h h without h at l without i tilde. Yeah? And then I do the other sum. And the other sum I have sigma i log sigma i appears here for sigma i plus minus 1. And what is going to give this? What? So this is going to be h i plus the sum over all the neighbors of, of i without j. And this will give what? The, uh, the logarithm of 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of j i l plus h tilde l without i divided, divided by 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of h l without i tilde minus j i l. Right? Because I have, the, I have one logarithm minus the other one, so this is the logarithm of the ratio. In the numerator, I have when sigma i is equal to plus 1. In the denominator, when sigma i is equal to minus 1. Good? Very good. Now you use, you're almost finished. Huh? And I'm missing 1 divided by 2 beta. Sorry. Now we have to remember that the hyperbolic cosine of a plus b is something, no? There is a formula. You have to speak up. Why is this uh, hyperbolic cosine? Why, why, is this, why is this a hyperbolic cosine? Because this is, the spo this is a real exponential, right? So, so remember that the, uh, what's up? Sorry? Ah, beta, yeah, sorry. OK, today I'm. This very good. Thanks. I need to take, to pay more attention more to the right. Why this th is this the hyperbolic cosine? Well, because yeah, because exponential of x plus exponential of minus x is equal to by definition hyperbolic cosine divided by two. Right? Sorry, uh, times two divided by two here. Yeah, it's just that. Well, yeah, this sum, remember that sigma, I'm not being explicit because otherwise it's a nightmare to write down everything explicitly. So some, some things I, I leave them is implicitly. The sum over sigma is over the values of sigma, which is plus 1 minus 1 for this case. Yeah? Very good. So now you have to remember that the hyperbolic cosine of a plus b uh, but it's equal to the hyperbolic sine of A times the hyperbolic sine of B plus the hyperbolic cosine of A times the hyperbolic cosine of B. Yeah? And you have to remember that the cosine, hyperbolic cosine, is an even function. Um, and that the hyperbolic sign is a not function. Right? Yes. So now I apply this formula here. And what do I get? It's equal to, I continue here, hi plus the sum over the neighbors of i without j of 1 divided by 2 beta, the logarithm, okay, I want to, okay, the, the 2 cancel with the 2. I don't have to put it anymore. And I have, instead of writing hyperbolic sign like this, let me write it like this, sh, right, of x. This is an hyperbolic cosine. I'm going to write it like this. So then I have hyperbolic sign of beta j i l hyperbolic sine of beta h l without i tilde plus the same for the cosine uh, beta j i l 
cosine beta h. Right. And the same in the denominator with a minus sign, right? With a minus sign in the right place. Right? So I'll have something like this. Um, minus, uh, no, this the other way around, minus here, plus, yeah, a hyperbolic cosine of beta J I L, hyperbolic cosine of beta H tilde without I, right? Are you with me? I hope so. It's a cinch, uh, cinch again. Cinch, cinch, cosh, cosh, cosh. Or what you? Cinch, cinch, yes. Okay, today I'm missing too many letters, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah? And then I take this piece, uh, which piece do I want to take? And then I take this piece of the hyperbolic cosines and I divide everything by this in such a way that here I have hyperbolic tangents. Right, so this is equal to hi plus the sum over L in the neighborhood of I without J of one divided by two beta, the logarithm, and I have one plus the hyperbolic tangent, and I, I write the H of beta J I L times the hyperbolic tangent of beta H L without I tilde divided by one minus th beta j i l, th beta h l without i tilde, right? Are you with me? And then I need to remember one more formula, which is the arc hyperbolic tangent, the arc hyperbolic tangent that I'm going to denote of x, that I'm going, going to denote, I'll write like a th, this equal to one half of the logarithm of one plus x divided by one minus x, yeah? So here, what, what, what do I have? I have one half of log of one plus something divided by one minus that something. Therefore, that's the inverse hyperbolic tangent. So therefore, this is equal, finally, to hi plus one divided, let me put the, let me leave the one divided by beta inside, the sum over all the neighborhood of phi without j of one divided by beta, the arc hyperbolic tangent of the hyperbolic tangent of beta j i l the hyperbolic tangent of beta h l without i tilde. And that's it, and this is what we call the message, right? This was this function that we introduced as u of h, u of j i l h l without i tilde. Clear? So the derivation is not difficult, it's just annoying, yeah? Difficult it is not. Very good. So then I left uh, last week an exercise where now we are in the, let's go to the first map and we did. The mapping we did, we have symmetric matrices, and we were worried about the spectral density or the, the empirical spectral density of those matrices, and we found out that this can be, you know, attacked as a spin glass problem. Right? So this, at some point, we wrote down what? We wrote down that is equal to the limit when eta goes to zero plus of one divided by pi n, the imaginary part of the sum of i from one to n 
of uh, delta i uh, of lambda minus i beta. Yeah? Or better still, sorry, let me uh, do an intermediate step, right? Of the expectation value of uh, xi squared for z equal to lambda minus i beta, right? And then here we realize, so we discussed that we can use the, the cavity methods, et cetera, et cetera, and we got the cavity equations for the measure associated to this expectation value where we have that the Gibbs distribution P of X is, was equal to one divided by set of a set of the exponential of minus a Hamiltonian where the Hamiltonian H of X was equal to uh, one half the double sum for I and J from one to N XI set a identity matrix minus A components I, IJ of XJ. Yeah, something like this. Again, today for some reason I'm missing letters, okay? So you just let me know if you you notice that uh, I've missed something. And then again, so the idea is to realize that for this object I can apply the cavity method here and I obtain the cavity marginals associated to the single set marginals. I need to solve this problem in a different, in a different way. So the cavity equations we got for the cavity marginals were these ones, no? Were pi xi without j is equal to a normalization factor one divided by set i without j, of what? Of the exponential of uh, b -b 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 minus set minus a i i, x i squared divided by two, times the product over the neighborhood of i without j of the integral d x l, of the exponential of, um, uh, blah, 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 that would be plus sign, x i a i l x l, times the marginal at node l, this would be l, sorry, when i has been removed. Is that correct? I think so. Somebody Last week told me that I forgot this thing. If you don't assume that the diagonal elements of the matrix are not zero, this, this should be there. Yeah? And then we discussed that, uh, you know, now this, uh, the, 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 the Danekal variable is a continuous variable, so you don't need an infinite number of parameters to fully characterize this distribution, but you realize that if this had a Gaussian form, then this is close under the Gaussian form. So then I'll let the, this, this following exercise that we're going to do right now, which is take a parameterization for these cavity marginals that captures this observation, the fact that these are, must be Gaussian distributions. Right? So we introduce the following parameterization, pi of xi without j is equal to one divided by a square root of to pi delta i without j of the exponential of minus xi squared divided by two delta i without j, yeah? And I have to do the same I did for the of the cavity fields, but in this case, so I have to plug this thing into here and we express this in as equations for the deltas, okay? So the only thing I have to do, or the first thing I have to do is this, this, uh, this integral. So let us do this integral. So I have the integral over dx, dxl that with the exponential, and now I put this thing, no? So I have the integral dxl divided by a square root of two pi delta l without i because be careful, this is the definition. Here the indexes that appear, they are different. Here it is at the marginal at node L when I has been removed. 
So the corresponding parameter would be delta L without I of the exponential of minus xi squared divided by 2 uh, delta L without I. And inside the argument of the exponential, I put this part here, no? which is plus uh, xi ail xl. Yeah? So far, so good. And then you know how to do this integral, no? There are many ways. Either you remember the formula, or you notice that the way to solve it is to complete the, the square, it's, do a change of variables, etc., etc. Okay? So what you can do is either remember the formula. The formula is uh, the integral dx divided by 2 pi with the exponential of minus x squared divided by 2 plus ax. This is equal to a exponential of a squared divided by 2. All right. So this integral is equal to what? This integral is equal to, so if you want, you can do a change of variables to put the, the deltas on the other side uh, in such a way that you have the same measure, and then you apply this, this formula. So at the end of the day, you will obtain what? You will obtain that this is equal to the exponential of, uh, I'm integrating over, this should be L. Huh? No, this should be, uh, this should be L, yeah, sorry. So I will obtain what? I will obtain uh, xi squared uh, delta L without i, a i L squared divided by 2. Yeah? I'm, not in, I'm doing a lot of mistakes today, apologies. Is, th is this okay? I think so, yeah? Now, I plug that thing, that thing back into there. So, on the right-hand side of the cavity equations for the cavity marginals, I'll have what? I'll have that P I H A X I, when J has been removed, is equal to a normalization factor set I without J, of what? Of the exponential, let me put it like this now, of minus Z minus A I I divided by 2, X I squared. And then I have this, which is this result, result here, and the product that I put inside the argument of the exponential as a sum. So then I have plus the sum uh, for L belonging to the neighborhood of I without J. This result over here, in front I have a half a one half. I can put up here X, uh, Xi squared divided by two. And then I have the sum of A I L squared delta L without I. Uh, let me rearrange this thing a bit. This now I can write it as one over the normalization factor. Exponential of minus, let me put it like this, minus one half multiplies to z minus a i i minus the sum of over l in the neighborhood of r without j of a i l squared delta l without i multiplying x i squared. Yeah? It's okay? I think so. And this must be equal, because this has to be a decavity equation to the of, of the cavity margin. I still remember that must be equal to pi hi, pardon, uh, xi when j has been removed. That must have this form, no? Must be equal to the exponential of minus xi squared uh, divided by two times 
uh, delta i without j divided by the square root of 2 pi delta i without j. So you see what I told you before. A Gaussian, when you put a Gaussian on the integral, you get back a Gaussian. And on the other side, you have a Gaussian. So it's clo the system is closed uh, when the functions are half Gaussian form. And from here, you can realize that, you know, the cavity equations become this, uh, the following. Uh, since this is a Gaussian, and this is a Gaussian, that means that the variance that appears here must be the variance that appears here. That means this delta i without j must be equal to the inverse of this. Yeah? So from here, comparing, you get that delta i without j, yeah? the parameter that appears here must be equal to the, the parameter that appears here. So therefore, this part or the inverse of this must be precisely delta, right? So delta i without j must be equal to, equal to 1 divided by z minus a i i minus the sum over all the neighbors of i without j of a i l squared delta l without i. Clear? Go ahead. Physical interpretation. Physical interpretation in this case, no. There is a mathematical interpretation. Physical interpretation, I have to think about it. Because since we are going from a mathematical problem, and we might be to a, to a spin glass problem, even though it's not a spin glass problem, right? Because this is what I mentioned before. This set is a complex number, so therefore the Hamiltonian is not a Hamiltonian, the Kirchhoff Boltzmann measure is not a measure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's difficult to see, to give an explanation of the physical meaning of this. Okay. There is a mathematical meaning, but not a fully a physical meaning, I would think. Sorry. <laughs> More questions? So, how do you find this exercise? This is simple. Do you agree with me? Yeah? Excellent, very good. Of a what, sorry? We, uh, what do you mean we, we take the expected value of the Gaussian? The ma ah, you mean the, this mapping, right, where, um, okay. So suppose that you, you want to calculate the spectral density or you want to estimate or approximate the spectral density of a, of a symmetric real matrix, okay? And you are, you are lazy and you don't want to de-analyze the matrix, because if you analyze the matrix, then, you know, to, to get the empirical spectral density is very simple, right? Or maybe it's not possible because the matrix is very, very, very large, right? So the recipe, you know, this mapping we, 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 uh, is actually exact, okay? So the spectral density, the empirical spectral density for a matrix A, rho sub A of lambda, we notice that it could be written like this. Uh, now in this formula we do something like this, right? So it would be one divided by Pn, the imaginary part of the sum i from one to n of delta, let, let us put the expectation by this square, one set is equal to lambda minus i eta. And I'm not putting that eta has to go to zero plus, right? So your question is? No, it's not taking over a Gaussian. Well, yeah, because they are Gaussian measures, yes. But the, but the question is, you use the cavity method to do the expectation value directly. Yeah, so therefore, you, are, you have already calculated the expectation value, and the expectation value is given are these variances, and these variances, they obey these closed equations. Yeah? Better? More questions? Go ahead. I don't see where the partition function uh, disappears. 
ah, well, okay, it's not that it disappears, it doesn't disappear, but of course you have to realize that this is the normalization factor of the marginal. So you know that if I were to integrate this, okay, this will give me precisely the square root of 2 pi i, this, this term inverse, and then when you, do, when you compare left-hand side and right-hand side, you get the same information from the normalization factor or comparing the arguments of the exponential, right? Because you know that, you, you see, this part, this has an exponential form. The numerator here has an exponential form. So you know that this, the variance that is captured by this expression must be equal to the variance that captured this expression. So this, this, will, this will give you this. And you say, what happens with the, with the normalization factor? Well, it gives you the same information. Because if I were to integrate this, because in the cavity equations are for cavity marginal, so the marginal has to be normalized, this will tell you, uh, after normalization, it, uh, it will tell you that this is equal to the square root of 2 pi, the inverse of this, because it's the normalization of this Gaussian. And on the other side, you know that also the normalization have to agree, right? So you, you get that the variance that appears in this normalization has to be related to the variance that appears here. And you get the same equation. So yeah. they are automatically... Yeah, they are autom automatically match. Good. More questions? Well, now, I left one more exercise, and then we're going to do a challenge. The exercise was the following. Suppose now you have, we consider... Um, Particular type of matrices. So remember, that this was for uh, n times n real symmetric matrices or a matrix A. Suppose that now I can I can I can, I can draw the matrix as a graph, right? Where the nodes are the is the number of nodes is the dimension of the matrix, and the links between the nodes are the entries of the matrix. Yeah. So suppose that I have a graph associated to this matrix, which is what I call the homogeneous random regular graph uh, with degree, let's say with degree, degree K, capital K. So what this thing means is the following. A random regular graph is a regular graph where the, each node has the same number of neighbors, which in this case is k, like for instance, right? So suppose that k is 3. So the graph would be something like I have one node, whatever, and this is connected to three other nodes. And these nodes are connected to other nodes in such a way that the degree is 3. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Okay, so each node has the same number of uh, neighbors. For this example, is three. Yeah. Now we assume that the graph is homogeneous. What does it mean? It means that if I see, what's up? You have to speak up. Sorry. No, okay, in principle, for, for regular graph, they are trees. But the problem with a, gra with, a, with a tree is like if you keep growing it, the boundary becomes larger than the, the bulk of the graph. This is what is called a Cayley tree, and sometimes deal, dealing with uh, Cayley trees can be a bit annoying. So to get, get rid of the part of the boundary growing exponentially, what you do is you grow it and, uh, to a certain extent, right? Like, for instance, you keep growing it. Etc. Etc. Then at some point you take the boundary and you start connecting the boundary, trying to keep also the degree. And of course there are many many ways of connecting the nodes at the boundary. For each type of different configuration, you get a different uh, regular graph. That's the name of randomness. Of random in random regular graph is the different ways you have to connect the boundary, the, the, the nodes in the boundary between themselves. Yeah. More questions? Now. The part of homogeneous, what, what, what does homogeneous mean? Well, it means what it means. So suppose I sit, my, I sit myself in this node. I'm here, and I look around, and I see something, right? 
And if the graph is homogeneous, it, this means that if I go to another node and I sit in that node and I look around, I see the same. Okay? So in this case, this means that I'm going to take for simplicity, I think I'll, I left a, a more general exercise. I'm going to take that the matrix entries, the diagonal matrix entries are zero for simplicity. Okay, I think I, in the nodes I left them as a, to have a given value, a node. And the off diagonal elements of the matrix, a, a i, j, were equal to a1 for i different than j. But let me take for simplicity a node equal to zero and a1 equal to one. All right? Tell me. Sorry? Yeah, it means that these things are always equal. Because otherwise, they, it wouldn't be homogeneous. Because I would go to a node and I would see something different if I look around me than in a different node. So what I take is that. Yeah, the difference is like, I, I, you're right, you're right. So I, I was, I didn't want to, 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 to use the word of, it has to be homogeneous and isotropic because in, this is a graph, you know, saying that it's isotropic when you have a graph is a bit weird. But it must be homogeneous and isotropic because it could well be that if I go, so for instance, I could have a, a tree where this link has a given value. Let us say, let us invent a number, no? Pi number e and a square root of 2, right? And this one, they also, they also have this, right? Pi a square root of 2 e, 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 e a square root of 2. So this graph would be homogeneous, right? Because they, they, if I move from node to node, I see the same. Yeah, but it will not be isotropic. So when I say here homogeneous, it means homogeneous and isotropic. That means all the links, they have the same value. Okay. Better? Go ahead. In what, in what sense do you grow? Ah, I mentioned before. In the sense that uh, you keep, imagine that you keep, keep growing this tree. You realize that the boundary grows exponentially. Yeah? So what I want to do, what, what I don't want to, to to be in a situation where the boundary is going to nomin uh, dominate the behavior, behavior of my system. So I want to, because the boundary is, has more nodes than the, than the rest of the, the, the interior of, of the graph. Yeah? So then I go to the boundary and I connect the nodes uh, of the boundary between themselves. But there are, you know, an exponential number of ways of making these connections. So a random regular graph, the part of the randomness of a regular graph is the different, different ways you have to connect the boundary between themselves. Yeah? So it's a tree at a given point, and then, of course, you are going to have loops. Yeah? The larger the tree, the longer the loops they are. Good. More questions? Excellent. So now, what I want to do is to apply this recipe to this particular case. So let us leave this equation here. So now, since the graph is homogeneous, meaning homogeneous and isotropic, yeah? So you see at each, so these parameters that I have here, so for instance, I have to go to a given node. Let's say that this is node i, okay? For which, for each node i, I'll have as many parameters as neighbors there are because I have to remove one neighbor per each node, yeah? So I come here and I say, ah, here I have this cavity variance, if you allow me to call it this way, cavity variance when I remove this node and this node and this node, right? And then I have to come back to another node and do the same thing. But since the graph is homogeneous and isotropic, this must be the same for all nodes and for everything I have removed because, you know, when I go to a node, I see the same, and when I remove something, I see the same, right? So for an homogeneous random regular graph, it must be that all these cavity variances, they are the same. Let us call them delta cavity 
for all i from 1 to n and for all j belonging to the neighborhood of i, right? Because the graph, the graph is homogeneous, right? I see the same at each node. Now, instead of having a bunch of equations, I just have one. Tell me. Yeah. There is no, yeah, 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 you can also do it. So, so I, I, was, I was trying to do the, the, the simplest case, but of course, suppose that A, A0 is different from 0, so here you have, on each node, you have loop. And you can take the, sorry? Well, well, no, no, the spectral density changes actually shifted, uh, and that's the only thing, that's the only impact that that number has there. Is, is the same form, okay. yeah? I, I, I will let this in as an exercise. Thank you for proposing an exercise. Excellent. Yeah? More questions? Go ahead. So, so since you have loops, like you're really belief propagation, how do you avoid loops? Like, it, it might not converge if you have loops? Or? No, no, because the loops in the equations appear like this, right? So it's A, I, I, and that in, the, in, in graph vision, this would be a node that starts at node I and ends at I. So the corresponding graph would be a one that has, has this uh, no, uh, loop at each node. And now the weight of the loop and the weight of the neighbors, they, they can be different and still, you know, the graph would be homogeneous. Sure. No, no, no. Okay, but okay. In graph theory, there is a difference, and sometimes physicists they, they mix the vocabulary. There is a concept of loop and a concept of circuit. In graph theory, when you mention loop, is the link of a node to itself. A circuit is a is a loop between different nodes. Okay. So this is a, a this is a, what in graph theory they call loop. The other things are refer, are referred to normally are called circuits. Yeah, but physicists they, they don't use that vocabulary. They, they refer to, you know, paths that connect nodes between themselves as loops, right? So, for instance, I don't know if I start with this node and there would be a loop, right? I go to this node, okay, and I come back. This would be what in the stack they call it a loop, but actually it should be called a circuit, whatever. Yeah. Can you speak up? In this equality? Yes. Uh, okay, help me. Uh, in which part you get lost? Ah, okay. So we are in a situation, well, now this graph is not homogeneous and isotropic anymore because it's a, it's a mess, okay? But we're in a situation where the graph is homogeneous. What, what this thing means is the following. At, at a, I'm at a given node i, and when I look around, I see something, right? I move at a different node, and when I look around, I see the same thing as so before. And that happens for all the nodes. Okay? Even the there are no boundaries because our random regular graphs. I remove the boundaries by, by folding the graph into itself. That's, that's important, yeah? So, since, one second, let, let me finish the arguments. So, so, you see, since the graph is homogeneous, so that means that this quantity that should depend on the side and the nodes I remove must be the same for all nodes and all nodes I remove because I see the same. I have uniformity in the graph. So that means that these quantities that in principle should vary with the nodes and the neighbors I remove, they must be the same for homogeneous random regular graphs. Right? Go ahead. No, I, I, I didn't catch up, sorry. In the case 24, there are no boundaries because the graph is kind of folded to itself. Yes. I don't understand how this happens. And you don't understand? I can see that we have an infinite graph that goes on forever with the same structure. We are homogeneous in this space. But, but if we, the graph is finite, I don't understand how, what does it mean that it folds to itself, but homogeneous? 
what I mean when I, I fold it into the self is like I create links between the boundaries, the nodes at the boundary. That's what it means. You see, I have, I have here one node, okay? And then this node will, will be connected to neighbors. Let me put these neighbors as a, as a circle, okay? So here I have the first, the first neighbors. And then in this next circle, I'll have the next neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. So here at some point, what I have is a bunch of nodes, yeah? And this would be the boundary, and the boundary grows exponentially. When I say that the, I, gra I, I fold the graph into itself, right, is that I take now the neighbors, and I connect them between themselves, right? This one, for instance, with this one, this one, to try to, sometimes it, it, you cannot do it, to try to keep the same degree. And sometimes it will not, this will not happen. This is true, okay? But a random graph, that this is the idea, and the idea is that it has no boundary. Because when you get here, you don't see a boundary, yeah? Sure. Neighbor, yes. Neighbor, yes. So then how do you do to keep the circle? Because it's an iteration, right? Yeah, no, no. For the cavity equations, you, you have, you start with the original, okay. you start with the original graph and you have to do this fictitious operation of removing, yeah, yeah for each node of the graph. And actually for each neighbor given a node of the graph. And then you iterate, you iterate this in on the cavity graph where you remove, you do this operation of removal. But the issue of homogeneity applies to this equation as well. Something will happen here with the number of neighbors. So you see, my original problem is like I have a graph with degree k, and I want like an homogeneous graph. And from, for this one, I want to calculate the spectral density. So I have to go to a fictitious wall where I have a cavity graph where the degree would be different, one less. And then was, when, once I solve these equations, I go to the original graph. But I don't see what, uh, what's, what's so problematic about removing something. I mean, rem removing something doesn't change the fact that the graph is going to be still homogeneous, right? I, my, my, my problem is if I remove a node, I have a neighbor that has a certain degree, like the degree minus 1. Yeah. And then the neighbor that has a degree greater than 1, I have Yeah, yeah, but the degree minus 1 will appear there. I don't know what is, what's, what's the problem with that. Can I continue? Okay, okay, yeah. yeah? No, I mean, okay. Yeah. It, it will appear. So the, the connectivity is here. This is the sum for L belonging to the neighborhood of I without J. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a graph where I have removed one neighbor. So for this, the cavity graph, the connectivity will not be K, it would be K minus 1. But still, this, these equations would be uh, R simplifiers for one variable. Okay. Yeah? More questions? Go ahead. Ah, for simplicity. No, 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 no. This, no, no, no. This is for the the, the pairs of nodes I, I, J for uh, for which there is a connection. Yeah. Because what I I cannot write down everything, right? So what I said that I suppose that now. Is uh, it captures some kind of uh, is the weighted connectivity matrix of a graph of a random regular graph. So when I say A I J, is for those nodes which are connected, yeah. And I I, I say that the way is equal to A one. Okay, more questions. More questions. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's like in the, it's like in when I introduced the cavity method for the easy model, okay, if I want to calculate the magnetization as a function of the temperature, you know, I fix the temperature, I run, I solve the cavity equations, and then I calculate the magnetization. I change the temperature, and from there I get the curve of the, of the magnetization as a function of the temperature. Here is the same thing. I fix lambda, I solve the cavity equations, I get the spectral density for a given value of lambda. So I have to run for different values of land. Unless you can solve this in exactly, which is what I'm trying to do for this case, and you don't have to do anything because you get the expression of the spectral density explicitly. Good. 
Uh, this is very good. More questions, guys. That's it. Can I continue now? Okay. Now, now since the graph is an homogeneous random regular graph, that means that these variables that in principle should be different for each node and each neighbor I remove, they are the same. Let me call this thing delta cap from cavity. And of course, since the, uh, in the original graph, you know, the number of neighbors of a given node, i, is the same. This would be k. Remember that this uh, contour of phi is the, is, the, is the nodes which are neighbors of phi. Okay, since it's a set, this absolute value is the cardinality of the set. So this is k. And therefore, the cardinality of delta i without j is equal to k minus 1. So in this sum, I have k minus 1 terms, which now are all the same because the graph is homogeneous. So that means if you uh, particularize these cavity equations for this homogeneous random regular graph, you obtain the following. <coughs> obtain that delta cavity is equal to 1 divided by Set, I'm putting that AII is 0 for simplicity, minus 0, minus K minus 1. The terms, the, node, the neighbors which are connected, I put uh, the same weight, which is 1 for simplicity, uh, times delta cavity. And then remember that I have to, I have to once I have uh, I solve these equations, I plug the solution of these equations to the delta i's in terms of the cavities, right? But again, the graph is homogeneous, so they simplify a lot. And that will tell you that delta is equal to 1 divided by z minus capital K delta cavity. And then from the original expression that the spectral density for this homogeneous random regular graph of lambda it was in principle equal to, okay, the limit <coughs> of eta going to zero plus of <coughs> one over pi, the imaginary part of the sum for i from one to n of delta i of lambda minus i eta. Since the graph is homogeneous, all the, all the delta i's are the same, so you know, you have n divided by n, right? And this will give you, for this particular case, that the spectral density is equal to the limit of eta going to zero plus of the imaginary part of delta of one divided by pi. Sorry for today. I don't know where my brain is. One divided by pi, the imaginary part of delta lambda minus i eta. Yeah. So all you have to do now is you solve this equation, which is a quadratic equation for a delta cavity. You put the solution here, yeah, and then you put the solution, the expression here. Take lambda, this, uh, you take z equal to lambda minus i eps, uh, i eta, and you take very carefully the limit when eta goes to zero plus. Good. Well, now. So let me see. Now, I'm not going to do the part because I'm a bit tired and I want to give you a challenge. Let me give you an intermediate step. So when you solve this, again, this is a quadratic equation, you put it here, you get that delta. is equal to the following, so let me see. Delta is equal to z k minus 2 of minus plus the square root of z square minus 4 times k minus 1 divided by 2 times k square minus 
z this would, this would be delta of z. Yeah. Yes. Well, now to put plug this thing into here and uh, into here, and you have to be very careful of, uh, of you have to know of a few results of distribution theory or generalized functions to, to make this limit, right? Because you see, so let us focus on, the, on this first part. And this part would be set divided by this, okay? I have, I have to take the limit when I plug all this thing into here, this one part where I have to make the limit of eta going to zero plus of something that is set or divided by k squared minus set squared where set, actually I'm going to put it, lambda minus i eta divided by k squared minus lambda minus i eta squared. Yeah. And to make this limit, and to do this limit, you have to generalize the results we discussed in the first, during the first day of the first week, which was the following. We saw that the limit when eta goes to zero plus of one divided by x minus i epsilon, right, was something. I let you this as an exercise to prove. Here, if you notice, you have something similar. Uh, this was something. Then you have to prove what happens for the limit eta going to zero plus of x divided by x minus i eta. Now you have to work out what this thing is. So once you work out what this thing is and you make this limit properly you should end up having the following expression, which is the following. So the final result is that the spectral density for homogeneous random regular graphs is equal to k divided by 2 pi of the square root of 4k minus 1 minus lambda squared divided by um, k squared minus lambda squared. And this is for lambda smaller or equal than uh, of the absolute value of lambda smaller or equal than twice the square root of k minus 1. And this has a name, it's called the Kesten Mackey distribution. Or Kesten Mackey distribution. I'll let you do this final part. Yeah. Questions? Uh, uh, can you repeat how we are supposed to get this uh, delta? How we are supposed to get to get which what? The expression for the delta of z. This expression from yes. here? Very good. So this, you understand that if I put the denominator on the other side, this is a quadratic equation, quadratic polynomial for, uh, for delta cap. I solve it and apply it here, okay. and it will give you this. I mean, you have to massage it a bit, but in the end, if I didn't do the mistake, you, sh you should get this. More questions? Sorry, I don't get what is the delta without delta sign. Huh? I don't get what is the delta. Ah, like the okay. Remember the following. Remember that there are two marginals in, in, all, in all these games. There is the real marginal at one side and the cavity marginals, which are close equations. So what you have is you have the pi xi that depends on the cavity marginals, and then you have closed equations of the cavity marginals. You know, the spectral density is given in terms of the expectation values of this object. And this object is parameterized by delta i. So this is equal to just 1 over square root of 2 pi delta i. 
exponential of minus xi squared divided by 2 delta i. It's like the, it's the same thing. Uh, it's the same thing as in the easy model. In the easy model, you have the cavity fields, and then you have the effective or, or physical fields. So you solve the equations for the cavity fields, and once you have that solution, you plug them to get the physical fields, and from the physical fields, you get the magnetization. So here is the, t is the same thing. Yes, okay, but why delta doesn't have k minus 1? I mean, why, di why does delta have that form without k minus 1 and without k? Why delta has? Ah, because, okay, remember, uh, uh, we, we had that equation as well, but I didn't write it. Okay. Remember that we have two sets of equations. One is a set of closed equations, and the other one are equations that relate the, in this case, the variances with the cavity variances. Yeah? So I have uh, delta i without j. This one is once more one divided by set minus i i minus the sum belonging to the network of i without j of a i l squared. You have this, and these are again the cavity equations, and then you have delta i is equal to 1 divided by z minus a i i minus the sum belonging to the neighborhood of i, a i l squared, delta l without i. These are closed equations for the cavity marginals, or in this case, the cavity variances, if you want them to collect like that. And once you have the solutions for this, you have to plug in, in this expression to get these variances. And these variances are the ones you actually need to calculate the spectral density. So in an homogeneous random regular graph, when you apply this equation to that case, you obtain precisely this equation. Because again, the graph, the graph is homogeneous, and here you are summing over all the neighbors which are k. Better? Very good. Go ahead. I think you have to prove it, or, or maybe there is another trick. Sure, I mean, okay, okay, sure. So let me give you, so what you have is the following, right? So you have is, uh, so there is one first part that was set divided by k squared minus set squared, yeah? But I can write this thing as this, no? Set of k minus set, k plus set, right? And I can, shall I continue? Ah, it's okay. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I, ah, I don't. Set divided by k minus set plus set divided by k plus set divided by 2k. So I need to understand the behavior of this, which would be lambda, you know, a variable shifted a bit with the imaginary part, divided by something minus that variable. So it's what I wrote before. So I'm not, I'm not telling you exactly the derivation you have to do. I'm telling you what, uh, uh, the, the spirit of the derivation, right? So in this, in this case, again, you have to understand what, uh, the limit when eta goes to 0 plus of this. You have to understand this to understand what, what, what would be the contribution of these terms. Yeah? Of course, here you'll have a real and imaginary part, but the imaginary. Yeah. Better? Yeah. More questions? Okay, what time is it? 21. Oh, dear God. Uh, okay, so let me give you a challenge for tomorrow. Mapping. And the idea of this mapping is the following, right?
right? So now again, for some reason, I'm interested in a problem in, in random matrix. I want to map it to a problem in a stack mech. So suppose again that I have uh, A is an n times n um, real symmetric matrix. And let us denote as lambda vector A. I call it A before. This is the spectrum of A, right? And now you see, suppose that A comes from an ensemble of random matrices, and I pick one matrix for A, A from the ensemble, and then I diagonalize. Of course, the eigenvalues are going to be real. Suppose that this is the real line. For a given matrix A, I would have that eigenvalues are somewhere, somewhere in the real line, like for instance, here, here, whatever. Let us say, and this is lambda one, lambda two, I can, I can order them, right? Lambda three, lambda i, lambda n minus one, lambda n. Suppose I take now a, a point in the real line, let us say this point x, this is point this one here, and I want, for some reason, I can explain later some motivation, I want to know what is the number of eigenvalues to the left of x. I want to know what is the number, or oh, I introduce the number of eigenvalues to the left, to the left of x. Which, of course, I can express as follows. I can express as follows. Let me denote this uh, number of eigenvalues to the left of, F, uh, of x, sorry, as i sub n of x, something like this. So then i sub n of x is equal by this definition to the sum of i from 1 to n of the Heaviside function of uh, x minus lambda i a. Yeah. Sorry? It's the cumulative distribution, but now it's not really a distribution, it's a random variable because I'm not doing the expectation value over this. Not, not, so now this is a random variable. So it's not a distribution, right? So suppose, suppose that A is a random matrix. For a given random matrix, this would be the distribution of the eigenvalues in the real line would be random, and therefore this object would be random. Yeah? Very good. Now I want to calculate the moment distribution function of this random variable. This would be a random variable now. This if A is random, then this number i and x is a random variable. And a way to characterize the, this random variable is to calculate it, is to calculate the moment generating function. So let us define as G sub x of mu, this would be the moment generating function of i sub n of x, which I denote as the expectation value with respect to this uh, ensemble of random matrices of the exponential of mu. Uh, of i sub n of x, right? Do you understand, more or less? So my claim is that this can be written as the expectation value of a partition function that depends on this variable x minus i eta, or something like this, uh, to the power mu divided by pi i times a partition function 
of x plus i eta to the power of minus mu divided by pi i. Okay. Where the partition function is again something you have to find. I calcul no, I, and I compute the spectrum. Okay, suppose I compute the spectrum, right? Or you calculate the, 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 the empirical spectral density. So remember that the empirical spectral density, as we define it, is for a given matrix. No, because we are we are going to look at the fluctuations of this number and not only the its typical its typical value, All right? So it's like a, going a, a bit beyond on, in the previous derivation. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Now. Is, is, uh, I, I introduced the spectrum uh, to, 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 to put it. This is like the question of the other day, right? So why I want to do all, all, of, all these derivations I do if I know the spectrum? That's not the point, no? The point is like I need, I, I need the spectrum to define quantities. In this case, the number of eigenvalues to the left of x. And then I want to recast this problem into a problem for a into a different problem for which I don't need the spectrum. So I can, I can work out directly with the matrix. Yeah. More questions? Good, so then I leave this in as an exercise. Right, to find this expression. And the other one is, you see now you have something which is equivalent to a partition function, you will see. And then you have to do this quench over the, uh, the, the average over the quench disorder, which is the matrices. But now, it's, this is very weird, but because the partition function is to the power of an imaginary number. So how are, we, how are you going to do this? And you have to find a way using the replica method to use to do this expectation value. That's it. Thank you. So, uh,